way back when I was about the landscape. I was about nature. And I think that happened because I started off in a city and I didn't know much about nature, but I enjoyed it. But I'm here because now I'm an environmental artist. I'm also a climate communicator. And I do most of that in museums and galleries. Then I will show my work in an institution. What they have to agree to is programming. And I'm very happy to say the American University Museum and the university agreed to that in terms of a whole three-day climate change symposium. So that is one of my missions, is always to link my art to the issues. And I always cite this exhibition in 2006 as my aha moment, the moment that I just knew meant that I had to change my ways and really think about climate change. And what did it was that blue and white painting. The painting was from 1976, but the show was happening in 2006. So, wow, 30 years. And I started riffing on that. And I realized that climate change is where I had to go. Why in 2006? Well, a lot was going on and climate change was in the air. You have Al Gore, you have Elizabeth Colbert. And that's where I was going. And I felt I had to figure out a way to make my language, my practice as a painter, do more than just paint pretty pictures. And I began processing images that spoke about these issues, first primarily in terms of repeat photography. This was a way that geologists and glaciologists had been mapping things aside from measuring, they took pictures. And I got a hold of lots of those pictures and did a whole exhibition all about that. I then learned about recessional lines, which is another way that geologists work and did a whole series of paintings about that. Landsat maps was another fascinating way for me to, to use the images because they're beautiful. But of course, I incorporated them in ways that spoke to the issues. And then I realized, well, I'm an artist that's always been out there. And now I'm relying on other people's visual information. And I felt that I had to begin bearing witness. And so I did starting in 2013, first in Kronerbreen, uh, Svalbard, 400 miles north of Norway. And I did a whole series of really exciting investigations in the North and in the South. Did photography, paintings. I got to the Patagonian ice fields. All that comes back to the studio. And then I translate. And they lead to other exhibitions. I have been doing glaciers for a while and I wanted to see some more in New Zealand. Well, you can't go to New Zealand without going to Australia. And if you're going to Australia, you have to fly over the Great Barrier Reef. And that began another whole investigation into coral reef ecosystems. That was in preparation for a show at the National Academy of Sciences. The show that just closed was called Seeing Climate Change. And I would periodically go down and watch people look at the work and of course, interact with the visitors. So this is uh, The Wandering Lake. It's a personal associative narrative meditation on mourning, caregiving, and landscape. Over an eight-year period, I studied the movement of natural and human-engineered water from The Wandering Lake, which is in Xinjiang in China, to the RLC in Uzbekistan, which shrank from state-led irrigation projects, to the longest aqueduct in the world. During this eight-year process, my child was born, my father also died. So personal experiences of joy and loss sit in relation to environmental and societal joys and losses. I think about the differences of scale as a way to make relations in the world and to bring things closer together, starting from the landscape and the monumental geography, governmental infrastructures to communities, to family, to one-on-one -on -one relations to individual bodies and as well to interiority. This project is Milk Debt. I made this soon after finishing Wandering Lake. It is a five channel video project where I collected people's lists of fears and put together scripts that were then read by women pumping their breast milk in locations, public and private. These performances alternated and played simultaneously with the scrolling texts of the fear lists themselves. Milk Debt is a project where I explore environmental and effective concerns. It makes visible people's anxieties over issues, personal as well as global. Milk Debt refers to the idea in Chinese Buddhism that a child is forever indebted to its mother for the milk she gave. Breast milk is created from blood when the body starts to produce the hormones prolactin and oxytocin. 
Oxytocin is also produced when one is in love. So in this state of love and survival, milk debt is an arrangement that binds us to our history as well as the earth and is an unpayable debt. During pandemic, I've been working on a collaborative project with an eco-feminist writer, Astrida Nemanis, and her sister, a scientist, wildlife pathologist, Alexia Nemanis. The scientist, Alexia, who lives in Sweden, does necropsies on porpoises. We are looking at the practice of necropsy to see how we can learn about endings of life, endings of species, and climate change. How can science be seen as a form of care, and how can we create care for scientists? I asked Alexia if she would be willing to add a ritual before she began necropsies. I asked if before beginning her necropsy, if she was willing to take a moment alone with the animal, to think about the animal, to touch the animal in a comforting way, and to take a photo, to have a momentary pause before she began and reconnect with the animal, to be reminded that necropsy could also be seen as an end of life caregiving and that the scientist is also a caregiver. Touch connects the scientist back to the dead, but formerly living animal to help the future of the living members of that species. The touch also re-embodies her in the process of her scientific work. Scientific practice is based on an objectivity. I wanted to ask what parts of themselves are absent when practicing science. In order to be objective, they have to refrain from emotions or their human subjectivity. When scientists are working with the dead, or the ending of species, where do they put that part of themselves? How can they deal with their grief or other emotions? As part of this research, we would like to create a touch archive of reflections of scientists and photos of the rituals of end-of-life care. And the scope of the project has sort of two components. One is to support scientists and to give them a way to reflect on their feelings as they do the work of end of life care in order to continue this work. The second is to use this information and photos of the touch ritual to present and connect to a wider public. The photos offer a chance for the public to witness the intimacy of these ending moments and also of scientific practice to connect to the scientists and the emotional labor of caring for the death of a species. There's a high rate of mental illness in veterinary sciences and possibly an added step to necropsy could help ground scientists within their practice. In Western context, which often thinks about life and death as separate and opposites, how can we reconnect the dead to the living and think more expansively about the connection? How could we introduce embodiment, giving a space for emotion and enmeshment into scientific practice to help the relation between humans and other beings? What would you like to see as a relationship between your art or arts in general? and the sciences. I, like every researcher I've ever met, they've been very generous. You know, I can give you story after story of how I've got to Cronenbrien and, and, and were able to walk on a glacier for the first time. It was a scientist that, that helped me do that. I'm there to learn from them and then I want to communicate what they teach me in a much more simple way. I'm learning a lot about this idea of the languages that we speak that are different and how to communicate in a way that is not necessarily just taking something from someone, but how to actually have this conversation, you know, between the languages that I would know in art and then the scientists would know in science and how very different they are, but that we can come to a place of, of discussion. And that's, you know, been a really interesting process. And I think that really just working in that space is an important part of the process and the work for me. That's been really valuable. Patty, you gave us a set of protocols transformed into rituals that were really based on an idea of empathy for the non-human and an understanding of uh, something that is in a state of passing, not just as a kind of clinical process, but as something that needs to be felt. Similarly, Diane, your photographs of being in those places, very important that you go there and you, you experience empathetically almost that, that situation. I was just wondering if you would like to respond to this idea of, on the one hand, a certain kind of empathetic experience, and on the other hand, these artworks as a kind of activist practice. I am a political animal, I'm a feminist, but I was never an essentialist. So I sort of did my painting practice and I was active in the feminist art movement. What climate change has done for me, it's, it's really allowed me to bring everything together so that because I feel so deeply about nature and about the environment, and because I am political, it's allowed me to kind of join those instincts together in an authentic way. And I think what makes Patty's work so fantastic 
is, you know, you brought those things out. If that scientist wasn't asked to do a ritual, I don't think she would have done it. So what you've done is you've brought that empathy to them. I didn't know till much later that when I first suggested it, she was very like, oh, that's not going to do anything. It's, you know, <laughs> she was. But then after practicing it a few times over the course of our research period, that it became a really integral part of her practice now. Artistic expression, creation, imagination are often thought of as kind of personal, partial, and scientists and activists are engaged in a kind of collective effort. You know, we need to mobilize a kind of a collective effort to bring about any meaningful change. So do you find that tension between the sort of standard practice of art creation and the ways in which scientists and activists work? Or where do you find yourself in that, in that relationship between those two modes of practice? We each do what we can do. Really, we're all after the same thing, right? And I think that's what Patty's bringing out. We might have different disciplines. But we all care about planet Earth and what humans are doing to it. And we're approaching it in various avenues. I think that's a great point you make, Diane. For instance, when I was starting this project, we basically, the first thing was that the reason why we're coming together is that we have this concern from our own positions, right, exactly. But we all feel a certain way about this and we have a different skill set. And so what happens when we think about each other's practices with this other lens. I do think about that in my work. I bring the personal in a way so that people can connect or enter into something that may be larger or more collective. Both of your works remind me in a way of a performance as a kind of life crisis ritual. The concept involves the idea of some symbolic performative act undertaken by a group or collective of people in order to engage with a problem that is not solved or fully known to them. And so in doing this kind of life crisis ritual, one is able to confront perhaps the enormity of the problem or the complexity of the problem, or at least break it down into some kind of meaningful possibility for some kind of resolution. It's an idea that's actually quite an old concept in performance studies, But I think it's coming back when we're dealing with these questions of extinction, extinction of species, extinction of land, the disappearance of the ice, and so on and so forth. You know, ritual has to do with people interacting with each other. And certainly, Patty's project is doing that. But I just thought of something else. Part of the process that I went through in this last big exhibition was working with curators. And we interacted in a way where we would developing an idea with the audience in mind, with the visitor. How are they going to walk through this space? What are they going to see? How is it going to impact them? And in a way, it's the ritual of not just my witnessing where I've been, but it's a cumulative effect that people can have when they're in a physical space being confronted by stuff. They don't know what it really is, but It's cumulative, and then there's, you know, wall labels and and text. And I watched people go through the exhibition, and it was almost like a ritual now that I think of it. It seems like also what you're saying is that it is a form of transformation, you know, where things happen at like a pace, and then they build, and then something happens to the viewer internally or Yeah. Diane, your paintings can be seen as embedded within a long tradition of landscape painting. And Patty, your work can be found within a tradition drawing on certain kinds of feminist performance practices. I wonder now how you see the earlier work you had done that was maybe more easily contextualized. Is it something that you still use as a touchstone? Is it something you would leave behind in favor of this much more global um, way of speaking. You know, I think that maybe the through line is that there is a lot of ritual involved in in my work. When I was making Wandering Lake, actually, I looked back at my performance practices and really saw a, a, a huge link with the body and this sort of impact on the body and the impact on the land and the rituals that are played out, you know, in between these two spaces. I feel a freedom now, maybe it's because I'm in my 70s, uh, but I can do anything I want. I know how to paint. So I'm going to use my skill set to do what the heck I want to do to to get where I want to get to to, to the ideas that I'm thinking about. So it's sort of like, you know, uh, I don't care about perspective or what. I just mix it all up.